The topic of police reform has been a hot topic. It's been a spicy tomato all over this culture and all across our land and actually all across the world. In the next couple of minutes, we're going to be talking about police reform, some of the very positive things that you can begin to see, some of the changes that still need to be made. Hang with us for a little bit. This show is called The Way Forward. Hello to my co-host that's out there, Jason Plummer from Litchfield, Illinois. What is up, my man? How you doing today? Doing all right, my man. Doing all right. Always great to see you and always great to have you. It's great to have a black guy and a white guy talking about police reform so that we don't swing one side or the other. We just hit the issue the way that God intends for us to do it. So there's some folks who are tuning in today. We want to say hello and thank you guys so much for tuning in for our show today. I'm doing it live on location in Franklin, Tennessee from a secure location. I can't say the address because I don't want everybody running down here. But nonetheless, comment section is turned on and you guys are more than welcome to jump in this morning and participate in our conversation about police reform. Got some very encouraging things to say. But first of all, Jason, you want to give a shout out to anybody as we get started this morning? Uh, yeah, just just my family, my mom, my, my uh, wife and my kids. Um They've been big time supportive of me, especially as I'm trying to get my doctoral work. And uh, they've picked up the slack in some areas. And so all of them, uh, everyone, even down to the little guy, Elias, they've all just been really helpful. So um, they deserve they deserve a ton of respect. Um, when I when I finish this thing, uh, they, they've got to be on the front cover somewhere. So. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. So fireworks for the family. All right. There's some folks that are jumping in the comment section and they're going to want to talk about police reform today. I want to just um, there's in the show notes for today. There's linked in the show this New York Times article, as well as several other articles that I've given you. But I want to read a little bit from that article, Jason, to get started here. And then you're going to lead us in a word of prayer and then we're going to get started. The topic of police reform has become a popular debate with one phrase in particular, inflaming people. And I bet you can guess what it is. Defund the police. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Law yeah. enforcement officials, politicians, and public safety officials have discussed this phrase <laughs> ad nauseum. And we've actually got some progress that's being made on these fronts. And we want to talk about those things. Still a long way to go, but very encouraging. Jason, would you lead us in prayer for our topic today? And then we'll jump into it. We'll dive into it full headlong. Thank you guys for joining us today. Father, I just want to thank you so much for Erskine and his uh, his life and his ministry and his family. And I just thank you for our friendship and our ability to be able to talk through things, particularly like police reform. And um, we just ask for wisdom right now as we talk. Uh, we want real solutions that the church can be a part of to help better the community so we can joyfully advance your kingdom by making much of Jesus. And so just bless our time together and bless our audience and help us to be productive and fruitful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, my friend, uh, I think what we can do to, you know, have an enriched time together is since we have the topic that's out there, there are a couple of articles and things that you wanted to share with the people. Um, what is something that you wanted to share with the folks? And we'll get started with that. We'll react to that. And here's what we'll do today. We'll react to that. I want to show something and then I want to talk from firsthand experience. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, in the area. And I'm working with a very special group of people. So if you're a police officer, you're somebody that's in law enforcement, you're somebody that's a policymaker, I think you'll be encouraged by what it is that we get a chance to talk about today. And if you're researching the topic, there will be some things that we'll add to the show today that will undoubtedly give you some more food for thought. So, Jason, go ahead and give us your article or a reaction piece to start with. Yeah, I got a chance to read the article from um, uh, the New York Times uh, how to reimagine policing and public safety that works for everyone. I believe that's the one I sent to you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's in the show notes today, folks. <laughs> yeah, essentially what it is, uh, the article revolves around a, um, a panel of participants um, 
police chiefs, um, some um, uh, activists and uh, mayors and stuff like that. People who've had interactions with the police department in some level, either on a professional level or inside of the community. And the whole discussion revolves around this idea of defunding the police. And um, what I what I liked about the article was um, all of them kind of came to this consensus that that language is really not helpful in some ways um, that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good idea to defund the police department. Um, but they did make the point that when people say defund the police department, that they have a different meaning, I think, behind it. Mm-hmm. Some, some actually believe get rid of the whole thing altogether. But many people are trying to use this idea of re Let's be clear. We're not saying that. No, no, no. We're, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that for sure. No, we're not saying that. But um, we're, We are not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not saying, uh, but they are suggesting that we reimagine what policing could look like uh, in America. And that are there t- is it time for reforms and changes um, that see, in, in, in my own words, a more proactive approach to to helping the community be healthier it's not just about fighting crime because you're also dealing with people with mental health and you're dealing with sicknesses and things like that so 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 where where does the police fit inside of this how can we best train them and then how can we best build relationship between the police and the um and the community um i, I think a general consensus of the article floated along those lines there's 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 a spectrum though right there's there's somebody's like no we need to Real, do the whole thing now and then and then another part of it saying no we need to um you know just try to reimagine it but overall that was my impression of the article yeah so if you're out there today and you're listening to this conversation do you think that the police as it's presently constituted and the way that it presently works is effective for the most numbers of people in the most numbers of places because i could imagine there might be some people who are in a rural area where there's maybe different types of crime that are committed there and it's not as fast paced and there's not as many people that they come across just by virtue of per capita that have mental health issues. And so the police, the way that they function for years may continue to be a source in which they say, oh, we, we don't really see in our community anything wrong. We've talked about that before, the disparity between living in rural areas and urban areas and some of the mm-hmm. urban centers where, you know, George Floyd, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, you can go down the list. There's usually population centers that these things take place. Um, and so if you're out there and you, you're at a place where you think, hey, policing, great. Don't change a thing. Then we'd love to see your comments in the comment section. Tell us why. Continue on, sir. Yeah. No. Well, from So I'm in I'm in rural Illinois. Right. Um, and uh, we've been building a relationship with the police department here. And I would say the community, for the most part, really appreciates the police department and the work they do um, in part because uh, we have a, a massive methamphetamine problem um, and a lot of crime revolves around that. So if, you, if, if the police respond to a crime, it's likely going to be connected to some case or not to drugs here. And it seems like the police have really taken this approach of, um, of trying to utilize community supports to try to help with some of these issues. Like I'll I'll get a phone call every now and then saying, Hey, we got a lady who's struggling here. Um, It doesn't make sense to arrest her. You guys have any support, any help we could do. I mean, if if we don't get this taken care of, we're going to have to because she's causing a disturbance, but is there any way we can figure out something to help this lady out? I've gotten phone calls like that from our police department. Um, And our police chief is doing a really good job of trying to build up community supports and utilize different avenues to, to deal with issues, not just get people to jail or not just arrest people and whatnot. And so somebody listening to the show in, in our community might might be on that end that says, hey, we kind of like what's going on here. Um, but we also have to recognize that may not be the normal in in other areas. Um, yeah, because you you guys are, what, three or four hours away from Chicago? Three and a half hours from Chicago and about, about 50 minutes from the Arch in St. Louis. Yeah, so <laughs> on both sides of you, there's a somewhat dramatic story dramatically mm-hmm. different storylines that are taking mm-hmm. place mm-hmm. either in St. Louis or in Chicago. And uh, that informs the discussion as well. I want to get a piece up here and then react to this piece uh, about police reform and how uh, religious leaders are being involved in this. And then I want to share some things. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll react to it. And then I want to share some things specifically from Nashville, Tennessee, 
that people would enjoy hearing. So here we go with this piece. Help, not handcuffs. That's what the mayor of Indianapolis and the chief of Metro Police are pledging after a meeting with with a group of faith leaders. WRTV's Caleb Molander explains the criminal justice reforms they're planning and what they mean for the Circle City. There was a lot to sing about at New Era Church on the North Side Tuesday night. We pray for peace, peace in our streets. Faith in Indiana, a group of religious leaders outlined proposed police reforms at their Fund Our Futures Summit. Lena Harvey is a volunteer with Faith in Indy. She knows the importance of mental health care. And it really needs to be something we have right here, right now for every Hoosier. You know, it needs to be accessible to, to every person that has a functioning body and brain that could one day have a crisis that they didn't expect and we could possibly prevent a lot of crime that way. Faith in Indiana believes that police officers should not be responding to mental health calls. Well, we believe that every Hoosier needs uh, care, you know, so there should be a smooth transition from the call to the uh, uh, 911 to the actual care that's, that's been delivered. So, you know, Hoosiers need help, not handcuffs. After months of discussion with their communities, Faith in Indiana asked Mayor Hogsett to create a robust clinician-based crisis response team to respond to emergencies and he agreed. But I'll be encouraging the inclusion of funds for a robust pilot program in that regard as early as the 2023 operating budget in the city of Indianapolis. IMPD Chief Randall Taylor also promised change, a way to track all pedestrian and tra traffic stops by race. Are you committing tonight to upholding yourself and your officers to upholding that policy, we stand with us and uh, provide your answer. Yes. <laughs> Chief Taylor also stands in support of mental health reforms. I've said in the past, uh, I don't necessarily think it's the police uh, department's job necessarily to handle all the mental health issues, but unfortunately, uh, there's no one really stepping up. Lena Harvey hopes these commitments to change will mean a better world for Hoosier children. They've had to watch us as we fail them in a lot of ways. And so I think that in order for me to feel like a better person, like a better mom, where else would I be right now? But asking for something that my son will probably need one day. Working. All right. So that's that story. And uh, yeah, let me let you react to that really quickly here. Fair use. Uh, but Jason, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I. I think it sounds like a, a – I like the collaboration. Um, I like the uh, the creativity with it. Um, and I like that uh, um, there's a community effort involved. The only, the only caution I have is, is, is I would like to see how we're going to help the uh, social workers be protected um, because some of these issues that they're dealing with, are are crazy like for instance i think it was just about three months ago we had a social worker shot um on a home visit uh just in springfield up the road here um and and there's actually a lot more cases like that of violence that come uh so i'm all, I'm all for it I, I i i'm all for i i agree with them i don't think the police have to necessarily engage some of these mental health issues but as i've seen in milwaukee and i've seen in in um springfield some of these issues get violent real fast. And so there's going to have to be a, a real strategy about how the police and the, and the social work area find ways to create safe barriers and to safe connections. Mm -hmm. um, because that's a real, that's a real issue um, here, especially on domestics. Sure. And yeah. uh, I think most police officers, when you talk to them um, who are in the field will say that some of the, maybe worst and scariest times that they have are some of the domestic calls that they have to respond to. And so yeah. thinking through the subject matter of having trained professionals who are mental health professionals, who are not necessarily law enforcement professionals put in a situation where they're immediately in danger in the places where they go does require some thinking and it does require some careful planning and obviously prayer. One of the things I wanted to highlight on this, Jason is 
Indianapolis is a little bit ahead of where we're at in Nashville, but we're not far behind. Uh, as many of you guys know, I'm part of a collaborative justice effort in Nashville, faith-based leaders called the Justice Circle Nashville. I presently sit as the co-chairman um, of that organization. And we've had some tremendous meetings. Uh, so in summers past, we've had meetings with police chiefs all over the world with the act or all over the world, all over the country with the Act Now initiative and hearing from police chiefs and some of the struggles that they were going through. As recently as two or three months ago, I've had the opportunity to uh, sit down with Sheriff Brown, who is the sheriff in Davidson County in um, Nashville, Tennessee. And then just this last week, we had the opportunity to meet with Ch Chief Drake, John Drake. Uh, who's the chief of police in Nashville and had a wonderful Zoom meeting with many faith-based leaders uh, and specifically the Justice Circle. And one of the things that they addressed was the exact same thing that they're talking about in Indianapolis, that there are that there is an understanding of the fact that there's mental health issues that need to be addressed and that police officers aren't necessarily the ones that need to be called for that. Although uh, there have been situations in which the police have been able to escort or have been in a situation of proximity there's been de-escalation of some violent situations. In fact, the chief was just pointing out that there was a de-escalation of a situation that had taken place, uh, almost like a hostage negotiation situation where a professional was called in and not necessarily the police to enact force. And so there are instances and occasions, specifically speaking in Nashville, where they're doing the very same thing. One of the phrases that I came away with, Jason, in that meeting the other day was that the police chief was saying, we're not going to fix our problem by arresting more people. Hmm. And I thought that was really wise on his part to say that, you know, it's not one size fits all. We can't arrest our way out of a problem and just say, okay, right. if that person has a problem, go lock them up. Well, that person has a problem, go lock them up, lock them up, lock them up, lock them up, lock them up. Because obviously, you know, that creates another problem and another series of problems down line if that's the solution. And well, so this, are, yeah, I'm go ahead. Sorry. This, this kind of out of sight, out of mind policy making is, is been rampant, whether it's through city city planning, um, or you see, I mean, you see it in neighborhoods, you see it in policing, you see it in, um, and even the way that uh, economies are developed in, in local communities, uh, it, it just is it's not been effective in actually dealing with the issue. More of us sweeping under the rug, and and the churches should have firsthand knowledge of this because uh, if you go to these churches, <coughs> you go to these churches where they're having to deal with uh, drug addiction or poverty or uh, or uh, broken families or uh, broken education and things like that. Um, they're right there in the front lines, and they're, they're telling you this out of sight, out of mind. If we can just tuck it over here, uh, that, that's what arresting does, right? Mm -hmm. Arresting says out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> you're, if you're not here, you're going to be put over here. Um, and and for, some, for criminals, yes, for some criminals, that's, that's what needs to happen. Uh, but for some people um, who are sick or need help, that's that's not, that's not the answer. Uh, so let me let me highlight a couple of things that in Nashville uh, are initiatives and programs that they're working on. Police officers uh, have created sports leagues for children, and police uh, chief Drake was mentioning the fact that he has four friends, of uh, four friends that he went to school with. Three of them have gone and done prison time, um, and two of them have done long prison stints. Of the four that he mentioned there, he was the only one that had gone to college and had gone and, and done advanced you know, education and so on and so forth. And he's, he was looking at his own life and using his life as an illustration and saying, had he not had after school programs, had he not had sports programs to be involved in, he was a very good athlete. Um, had he not had those things and coaches and mentors and other community support that were around him, he could have very easily seen himself hanging out with his friends doing the same things that his friends were involved in, getting caught up in that kind of lifestyle, and then having a life direction and course that went far off the path that he's on now. And so he's wanting to use that experience to revamp, as it were, some of the sports programs that have been created so that we keep youth off the street and we keep them involved with responsible, productive, positive adults who are helping them to further a career. Beyond that, they're also looking at, and this is where I jumped into the conversation, not every student is skilled athletically. And so for those that are musically inclined, they're looking to partner with, here we go, raise your hand, partner with musicians, people who have access to studios, people who have access to music, training, classes, so that they can get students who are musically inclined to be able to have that as an outlet to, again, positive community uh, efforts that are going on there. In addition to that, 
They're wanting to bring along those who are gifted and skilled and responsible adults who play video games. Yes, we're at that age <laughs> where video gaming can be a college scholarship that you can get. And so people who are skilled at playing video games, who are willing to be mentors and come alongside these children, they credit video games, ironically enough, <laughs> even as it rots our mind, they credit video games and the ability of these video games to keep kids off the street but inside as being a deterrent to crime. And so I'll let you react to any of that. But I wanted yeah. to just simply say that in Nashville, yeah. those are present programs that are actually going on. And then we'll follow it up because I did ask a question. I, I love it. I love it. I love everything you said. Um, obviously, I'm a proponent of the mentoring because that's kind of what that's kind of in my Easter. That's what egg. you do. That's what I do. Um, I'm a massive proponent of it. I was I was somebody who experienced it. Um, I was just telling a young man yesterday that I had two influential coaches who um, were massive in my life at a time when there was some family strife and struggle and I could have easily gone one way. And I remember one coach had these big old hands and he'd put them on the back of my neck and just kind of stay mm. in the direction. And, <laughs> and uh, I just remember just kind of wherever he wanted me to go, I went because you know? <laughs> it was just kind of a, he just kind of had that kind of presence in my life. And, um, and uh, he was amazing. And, and I would, I would I'd love to hear that the, uh, the, the the police chief is is thinking like that, because I, I think that is a big solution. Here's my my caveat to the to the church. Um, I would contend that those relationships are extremely important and will be helpful in a lot of ways. But if the, if the church does not apply itself or insert itself in. Come on, come on. Relationships even those relationships will fall short because I would, I would contend that biblical mentoring, um, which is a, it's a form of discipleship. Uh, I would contend that biblical mentoring is a tool that God uses in, in meaningful relationships to um, in a shared community context to, to develop moral wisdom and practical wisdom uh, over time through the power of the Holy spirit. And when you're, is my praise. Is my praise there. Um, There's more when, coming. Yeah, when when you when you're able to take um, Christ people, spirit empowered people who understand his his word and are committed long term over time to these children um, in a shared community context. Shared, right? You got to be together. Uh, you can't just come in and search yourself and then walk out. Like you got to actually get in there with them. And when you do that and you have that kind of mentoring, um, God uses that relationship, that shared community context with his word and his spirit to do a holistic change. And that changes that changes the community over time and changes. Life. So, yes, the church, sir. So the church, the way forward for the church is to get in there, play those video games do those athletics, do that music, and share the gospel and live the gospel with them I, I, inside and out. Um, I, I have a personal uh, stage nah. this. I, I get up and I, I have this one young man. Um, I pick him up for school every morning. I pick him up from school every more, every day. I take him to, my, to the program. I invest in him. And I take him back to his house. And his, his dad's on drugs and and I got to look out for him and I have to sit him back in that house for eight hours and look forward to getting the next day. And it's paying off. Like I, I just see God at work in this kid. So. Amen. Amen. Yeah. couple things I want to jump in. Um, obviously the long haul, we're in this for the long haul. Um, hearing a lot of that, but I wanted to just quickly share that, um, you know, one of the questions that I asked the police chief is obviously these are wonderful programs and plans that you have in place and momentum. And I think the time is right. I think people are having the discussion in a thoughtful way. I think people are responding very positively to these changes that are being made and to the interaction of the police and the community, understanding their community, having a better roadmap of what their community needs are and a better response to what the community needs are and the more appropriate resources accountably given to uh, various areas but i said man chief chief drake 
do you have a budget for this? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Which <right? laughs> we got to come down to some practical <laughs> questions. And he said, uh, everybody's on board for it and there will be an increase in budget, but we don't have the mm -hmm. budget to do everything that we're proposing and wanting to do. Wow. That's why we are connecting with faith based leaders and asking yeah. them to partner with us because we don't have all the buildings. We don't have all the gyms. Right. We don't have all the studios. And I don't think at this juncture, Jason, I want to be asking the police to go and build a recreation center. We already mm -hmm. have that. Many yeah. churches already have a recreation center. And so why right. am I asking the police to do that? Why am I asking yeah. the police to build stadiums? Why am I asking the police to build studios? We've already got those things. And as believers who are mindful of the kingdom of God, we can use those resources to the glory of God. Now is an opportunity and time for us to step up like never before and use the resources that God has already given to us. Oh, my, my man, we have seen that firsthand when the pandemic hit and we had families who didn't have internet. Um, it's, and it's odd to say that, right? Because we're in a time when everybody seems to have it. We had families who didn't have internet, they didn't have computers and they didn't have a, they have a place to do this education. And so when the school went to a hybrid model where, you know, you stay home two days and you have to go to school two days. Well, for two of those days, actually three of those days, because Friday was an uh, e-learning day for three of those days, those kids had no no support. Um, well, we have this massive building <laughs> like we have all this Internet and we have all this all these resources um, that was able to open up and bring these kids to our church and utilize it all. And it didn't cost the district a dime. It, it didn't put anything out for the for uh, any of the other programs that are out there. And we got to actually do real life ministry. It's a win win for everybody. Sure. It's huge. Uh, and and now you know, of course, now our budget needs help. But that's where the church <laughs> needs. Um, but you know what? We serve a God who I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That kind of stuff. And according to His glorious riches, He can provide for us. We got the faith to, to work that out. Um, mm. I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a huge proponent of it. And one thing I would like to do in Litchfield is build more relationship with the police department so that the kids get to see these police officers, not just when things are going down their house, but when they're, yeah. you know, like in a barbecue setting, or what if we do it in a mentoring setting where we, we actually build something here, um, that is able to support the community in those kind of endeavors where mentoring, woodworking, uh, fishing, the rural stuff that we do here, right? We could take on that. The community yeah. we do that. We can take on that. I want to hasten to say this because I think this is an important point. So Chief Drake is a man of faith. He attends a, a church, and if he probably wasn't on the police force, he would probably be a pastor because he's mm. in the African American community, from that community, conversant in that community, conversant in the gospel. He's a man of faith. He brings preaching style to the way that he does his <laughs> leadership. <Yeah. laughs> Hallelujah. This That's almost what you feel like when it, when he's giving a, a topic or a discussion about something. But he gave one story that I think the reason why we wanted to meet with him is we wanted to just get a sense as to who he was, what his vision was, and how he wanted to operate. And he said there was one situation we had to go into. It was a house. It was a rest. Kind of a messy situation. He recognized, and here's his heart, and I wish this was everybody. He recognized that there were kids that were standing around, in mm. particular the kids of the man that they had to arrest. Mm. recognizing they had to arrest this man. They had to do their job. But yet these kids that are watching, he took the time to get down on his one knee, pull the kids close to him and say, you know what? We're going to get I'm getting choked up. Mm. We're going to get your dad the help that he needs so that we can be a part of restoring your family. Mm. That's huge. That's good. So, you know, I think faith matters. Yeah. I think compassion matters. I think that some of the, the hardline discussions that we have about defunding the police and critical race, I think that at the end of the day, Christians who have compassion, who recognize that there's something larger than just the issue that's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. We need to be mindful of that and thoughtful of that in these days. It, it, it's, it's the same tactic we use with our kids we'll see all kinds of behaviors crazy sometimes crazy behaviors but you got to pause and get to the bigger picture get to the heart figure out what's going on it's not just about reforming behavior but, but but get to the heart of the matter 
And that takes time. It takes intention. It takes having your, you know, you take one in the chin and you turn over, you, you come back and, and then you, then you meet mom and dad or, or mom or just dad or, or grandparents. And you realize, well, I can tell you why there's just so much going on here. There's a lot of brokenness. Um, yeah. We've got, we, we've got to be willing to get in there and get complicated and get messy and, and do that. Get on your knee and say, look, we're going to figure this thing out. Um, we're we're going to, we're going to, I love that. He, 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 he thought of the kids. And one of the things I can, I really do appreciate about our police department here. I've heard countless stories where um, the officers have done the best they can to, to not try to send an image to the kid that's going to put a, a bad taste in their mouth for the police later, whether it means, Hey, look, you know, we've got to help mom and dad out or, Hey, we've got to do this. And maybe they, 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 they set the kids somewhere else, but they're trying to be really meaningful at how they handle this. This doesn't, this doesn't have to go south fast. We can do this in a way that, that, that keeps that family together as best we can. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, but I, I think it happens enough here that, that I, I can respect it. Um, here's the other side of that. So this guy's, this, your police chief's a believer. When we invest the gospel in these kids, say like mentoring, we're hopefully raising up more police officers like him. <laughs> right? we, we yes. Want to, yes. We want, to, we want to give these kids character and compassion and, and we, we want them to be invested in their communities and we want them to be dependent on Christ and, and living for him. And then we want them to put them in the police force to do the things that you're saying are, are valuable. And um, it, it's just, there's a good cycle here, right? <laughs> it's a good, there's a good cycle yes. to be a part of. It doesn't have to be all, you know, crazy. I, I love it. No, man, that this kudos to you guys for putting so, God who does that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the questions that I ask, being a very inquisitive person uh, that I am, uh, is, you know, obviously with all the bad press that has taken place, the even the fact that we're, I think <laughs> there are probably people who are watching this today, they're like, oh, I'm a little bit hesitant to comment or Facebook is watching this. Going, oh, I don't know if we want to show this because the topic of defunding police is mm -hmm. such a hot button issue. A lot of negative press is out there. And I said, so with the attrition rate being the way that it is, and you just spoke to this issue, Jason, of, you know, what are the next generation of police officers come from if everybody is quitting so the national yeah. attrition rate is about 16.8 percent uh, according to chief drake in nashville and i asked him about this it, you find it at about 7.8 percent because they've done a lot he's really thoughtful about how they use the police academy to recruit and to train and to ingrain some of these characteristics and habit from the level of their training and incorporate that into the police force. And so he said, obviously, we've lost a lot of police officers due to the bad press and what's going on in our society today. Obviously, we've lost a lot of police officers due to, you know, COVID and some of the concerns about budget and monetary things and opportunities that are found elsewhere. But there is a, an influx of people who are starting to come alive to the idea that we reimagine policing and change it from this moniker of we got to be the, the guy that's going to go out and arrest these people and we're chasing people down the street. And, you know, so the crop of police officers that you're now getting is a different breed of police officers would to God that those would be believers who mm. have the mindset of doing their job to the glory of God and discipling while at the same time serving uh, in the community. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I, I amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> you, you need them in, you need them in the police force. You need them in education right now. Um, that's another, that's another topic, man. You see teachers is, I wonder what the attrition rate for teachers is right now. Uh, seeing the, the bad press they're getting. And, and, and I, there's just so much opportunity for the church. If we will invest uh, our time and our resources in advancing the kingdom of God, even it's through biblical mentoring to these children um, and the aim that we, we send them to the police force, we send them to education Hey, these are good. These are good jobs. These are good investments in the community. Uh, you're the kind of people we want making these kind of decisions. Um, and we've actually trained them up to do that. Right. Like we, we've trained them up to have that kind of wisdom and compassion. That's why I talk about mentoring with moral and practical wisdom, because it's, it's, it's changing the heart, getting the heart to understand, but also giving them a tangible skill 
that they can use to actually reinvest in their community. Mm-hmm. And I, I would, I would love to see um, programs like that um, inside, inside of the community. I, I'd love to see that the church and the, and the police department work more together to that end. I, the, the moment we separated everything into these little categories, we, we screwed ourselves. Yeah. Big time. And we're seeing the fruit of that. We, and we need to get closer to these um, relationships. And we are so much stronger together when the police department and the church work together, when the school and the church work together. Uh, this idea of segregating people out is just not working. It hasn't worked. And it's, it's, it's just not even the way family works. It's not the way community works. Um, build those relationships, build those partnerships, utilize all the resources, come together and, um, and invest into the next generation. Amen. This has been the way forward broadcast. Uh, we on the weekends have these discussions. You're welcome to be a part of it. The comment section is turned on until the end of the show, but get in contact with us and let us know what your thoughts are about any of the articles that we've put in the show notes about comments about, uh, what the police force is doing in your area. Have you seen some of these changes begin to take place? Are you a part of some of these changes that are taking place? Mm. And what do you think about some of these changes? This is the way forward.